Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Bowman from Common Sense, and welcome to our first family movie night. The idea behind our new series is to have a conversation about the content that you and your family are probably watching right now. Our goal is to elevate and explore the best media and to bring some extra resources to you to help you discuss the movie at home. I'm sorry that many of you are a little bit confused about whether we're screening the movie tonight. Uh, I think we're going to end up calling this a movie club going forward so that like a book club, you watch content and come together to discuss it. Common Sense is a national nonprofit working to help kids thrive in the digital age. We rate, educate and advocate around all the issues pertaining to your family and technology. That means that we review all the media and help you to make decisions about what you and kids, your kids are going to watch. We offer parenting advice around technology. We also rate and review ed tech for teachers and create curriculum for all students that teaches safe and responsible use of the internet. We advocate for privacy and for closing the digital divide at both the state and national uh, federal level. And we research all sorts of uh, media use and salient topics around technology for families and teachers. Behind every review and lesson that we create, is a staff of committed and enthusiastic child advocates. We need your help to ensure that our resources remain free for all of our audiences. That's very important to us. So if you use our resources in your life and you appreciate them, we hope you'll consider a gift to support everything that we do. Thank you. We really love that The Social Dilemma has created conversations in your home about topics that are close to our heart and mission. Um, Tristan Harris, who's the Google ethicist that you know from uh, the film, is a friend of Common Sense. We have worked with him over the past few years on these topics, and we're thrilled that they're bubbling up uh, thanks to Netflix's documentary and Jeff Orlowski. We've gathered your questions in advance. We're excited to talk with the filmmaker and have him teach us more, and we'll get to most of the questions in the course of the afternoon. Thank you for sending them. Finally, our editors have rated this film as appropriate for 13 plus. But as with all of our ratings, you'll be able to make decisions about whether they're right for your family by reading our review. So now I'd love to interest, uh, introduce our moderator for this evening, a friend of Common Sense, Professor Gabriel Kahn. Gabe teaches at USC, where he also studies the disruption and evolution of the news industry. He has a wealth of knowledge about the economic model of the platforms discussed in the movie, and he's worked with our teen councils of, over the last two years. So thanks so much, Gabe, for being here tonight, and I turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you so much, Sarah. Welcome, everybody. Uh, let me first start by just introducing the people who are going to be on our panel. Uh, Jeff Orlowski, who you've already heard about, of course, is the uh, the creator of The Social Dilemma and is a documentary filmmaker uh, who also made notable films such as Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral. Uh, and we'll be having a conversation with him. Also with us, however, is Nina Morgenstein, who is a member of the Teen Council of Common Sense Media, a senior in high school in the Bay Area. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Nina. And Jeff Knudsen, who works on the education team at Common Sense Media, a former teacher, uh, someone who creates the kind of content and tries to help sort of guide the discussion for educators and parents and children as they try to navigate the news media landscape. So first of all, let me, let me uh, just start this off with you, Jeff. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the success of this film, the impact that it's having and the conversations that it's starting. You've really framed this issue that we all struggle with in a, a powerful way. And it's, I hope that the impact that this film is having continues. In watching the film, certainly Thank you. tech addiction, uh, interaction with social media, the problems that that creates is something that impacts all generations, uh, including myself. Right. I did get the sense that you were kind of speaking to one particular audience with the film, possibly teens. And I don't know if you feel that way about that. Um, but could you talk a little bit about how you can see yeah. the audience for this? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't feel like the, the teen audience was our sole focus. Um, uh, in, in fact, I feel, I, I don't think that was my, my primary hope or objective. I think one of the big realizations that we had while making this film is that our technology touches everybody. It touches 
like the the nearly three billion people on social media on these platforms on a daily basis. Um, it affects people at the individual level and it affects our societies at the societal level. Um, and the things that, that are somewhat the most concerning for me are the um, the impacts of polarization, misinformation, conspiracy theory, how it's shaping our sense of a shared truth, it's shaping people's realities and worldviews. Um, and that's having impacts on democracy and it's having impacts on our ability to solve problems like climate change. Um, so it was, it was actually a real challenge for us to wrap our heads as a team around the scale and scope of the issues to be able to put it all into a singular film that hopefully can affect um, and impact emotionally a lot of different people at a lot of different levels. Well, clearly the timing is propitious because here we are on the eve of an election and yeah. the fact that we do not have a shared reality, that we do not have a yeah. common set of facts is painfully obvious every day. I'm curious, as you began making this film and through the process of making it, um, did your own views or understandings of this issue evolve over that time? How did oh, you completely. How did you come out? I went into the project a really heavy social media user and I came out completely not touching it at all. Um, I think that's the, the most uh, explicit change that I've gone through personally. Um, I was a very, very heavy social media user. I, I went to Stanford, I graduated from Stanford and a lot of my friends uh, ended up working in tech. And for a long time, I think we all had this, you know, rose colored glasses perspective of what our friends were making and contributing to the industry. Um, and it really was a shock to me in 2017 when I started hearing from Tristan Harris, um, an acquaintance through Stanford that I had known in passing. Uh, uh, I, I was blown away to hear his argument that there was something fundamentally wrong with the way the technology was designed. Not just how it's intentionally designed to manipulate people, but the underlying business model that incentivizes uh, a whole, uh, there's an incentive structure that has countless consequences. And that really became the exploration for me and for the film. What What is this business model incentivizing for the social media and the search engine companies? So we were really trying to look at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, Google, like as the, as the category, right? Yeah. But, um, uh, and, and it's, a, it's an important point to bring up because like Apple selling us hardware, right? Um, there are companies, I mean, there are critiques that are worthy critiques of Apple and Amazon and Microsoft and others, but we didn't try to go into that in the film in, in that um, we were trying to hone our commentary around this micro-targeting, surveillance-driven, advertising-based business model that we now see the incentives of that business model are having consequences. So I definitely want to get back to the business model because, um, yes, you you very clearly sort of framed it connection that happens when you've got uh, financial incentives, massive data collection, and then essentially this use of computer science to probe human psychology. Right. I think right. that there is kind of also an empowering point in that, which I hope that we can get to later. I'm curious, when now that you've, you've been able to speak to a lot of people who have seen the film, you've seen the reaction to it, um, is it, are there any questions that you'd like to ask people who have seen the film, particularly teens who have seen the film, are you curious about what they're getting out of it? Has anything surprised you about the reaction to that? Um, when we were at Sundance earlier this year in a pre-COVID world, which seems so far and distant from now, um, we did a high school screening. And it was uh, really spectacular to be in a room uh, filled with high school students and to hear their questions and to ask them questions and to see how it was um, their recognition of how this technology is affecting their lives. Um, in many ways, teenagers are living this day in and day out. You know, I'm old enough, I'm, I'm 36, I remember a world before social media, I remember when social media came into my life, and I remember what that mental clarity and mental freedom was in an age before social media and this, this seemingly need to constantly be on, that your whole friend circle, your peer group is on these platforms and this pressure around needing to be on to engage with, uh, with a friend circle. Um, I remember the value of having your mind wander and just being able to have your own thoughts and to sit and reflect. Um, and actually for me, this was a really sort of meta reflection over the course of making the film in that there were times and periods on, in the making of the film that were really creatively challenging and that my writers and my editors and I were really struggling with how are we trying to convey certain ideas. 
And that was overlapping with the period when I was weaning myself off of social media, going from a very, very heavy, I would say addicted user to, um, to really trying to remove myself and getting down to like no time on social. Um, and in that transition, I could feel my mental energy going towards the creative processes that led to the making of the film. Um, that was a, a really, really powerful sort of realization for me. When am I having my own original thoughts? When am I thinking creatively? When am I um, coming up with new concepts and ideas? And now it, it frightens me, the idea of going back to these platforms because the the way the algorithms work, they're just going to continue to reverse engineer each and every one of us and figure out what works on each and every one of us. And they really are this this time suck that um, I, I wasn't finding the value out of them um, compared to my own mental clarity. Um, so that is a powerful, uh, I think, sort of testimony about, um, yes, creati creativity is the product of boredom basically. Yes. Um, yeah. And, we've been and this word boredom. boredom is loaded, right? And I, yeah. I, I try to use a different mindset, but I'm, I'm completely with you. There's value in boredom. When you think about like, where do you have your creative ideas usually? Like people always talk about the shower. The shower is the place where you don't have your phone usually. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there have been definitely times where I've wanted to bring the phone into the shower, but, but um, uh, you have this sort of time and space for you to explore mentally. Sorry, I was cutting you off there, Gabe, but- No, not at all. I mean, um, I, I, mean I am curious, um, when you were a heavy social media user, what was your drug of choice? Um, Facebook was my drug of choice. Um, okay. and, and here's an interesting point. Um, each platform is sort of reverse engineering each and every one of us. I find some people are really drawn to the information available through Twitter. Others are really drawn to the visuals through Instagram or Snapchat. Others are really drawn to YouTube as a social media platform that has algorithms that are gonna, you know, you go watch a, a video on YouTube and four hours go by and you're sort of like, what happened? Where did all that time go? Um, and, and I was finding that Instagram and Twitter didn't really work on me, like they weren't, super compelling or engaging for me yet other people they're obviously like a huge a huge place for um for attraction um and so for me it was facebook uh that's where i think i had built my strongest friend community and i was just getting lots of affirmation through things that i would post and things that i would share there was one point when we started working on the film that i my writer and i we were talking and i asked to see her phone and i gave her my phone and i looked at her facebook feed and she looked at my facebook feed and we are very good friends, lots of mutual friends, very overlapping worldviews, and yet our feeds were so completely different. Mine was literally at the time like the 2016 election, just nonstop content on that. Her feed was really like bunny rabbits and baby photos. Um, and I looked at it and I was like, this, this doesn't do anything for me. Like this doesn't make me want to stay on this any longer. And this sort of reality swap that we went through was just so crystallizing for me. Um, one of the lines in the film, uh, Roger McNamee, one of the early investors in Facebook, he says, there are 2.7 billion Truman shows operating around our world. And for teenagers today, they never saw a Truman show probably, right? But the, the movie was this entire artificial reality created all around one person. And this one person's entire life was, um, was really designed by this entire kind of behind the scenes operation. Um, and that's that's how I look at these platforms. Um, I am getting my own customized worldview. Everybody is getting their own customized worldview. We're getting personalized news, which is just oxymoronic in and of itself, like um, that concept. But it, it, this also leads to one of the things I've, I've been really trying to suggest to people in that if there's a family member or, or a friend that you disagree with about politics or you have a harder and harder time coming together around a shared conversation, do a reality swap, like show them your feed and take a look at their feed. And can that be an opportunity for people to come together and recognize, well, wait a second, where are you getting your facts from? And this is where I'm getting my facts from. And let's come together around, so what's the truth? Where is there a shared truth? How can we even come together around how we need to address issues um, if we don't have a shared truth? Um, I mean, I think that we all feel the the impact of this, particularly in this moment. Um, it does right. seem to go ahead. Um, let me. That was very interesting to hear what you had to say about the watching the reactions of teams uh, at Sundance. I want to bring in Nina, 
uh, who yeah. is age appropriate here, uh, a senior in high school in the Bay Area, a member of the team council. And Nina, I first want to just ask you about your reaction to the film and if there was anything in particular that struck you. Um, obviously, this is something that you live on a day-to-day -day basis, as many of, else, uh, of us do. But from your perspective, what hit home to you most? Well, first of all, I just have to say, I was very disturbed. Like, I, I, I couldn't stop thinking about what had been brought up in the film. And um, right after I watched it, I noticed that I went on social media because that's what I do. I check Snapchat and Instagram. And I started getting really creeped out by the suggestions and um, when I was getting notifications and all of that. And ever since I've watched the film, I've been very creeped out about um, just everything around social media. And I was also really curious about um, how do we, how is it possible to have technology that is ethical? and social media that is ethical, that isn't Great using question. us as the product. Is that, I mean, that's yeah. that's my question. <laughs> yeah, sure. let's jump into that. It It is absolutely possible. And this is one of my biggest hopes is that we go down this path. Now, let me, let me just give you an analogy for a second because I, I compare this to the fossil fuel industry in, in, a, in a number of different ways, but the fossil fuel industry figured out a way to, oh, we found this resource in the ground and if we dig it up and if we burn it, um, look at all the opportunities it provides people. We can move, we can transport ourselves um, and look, we can make all this money off of it too. And only years later did we recognize that there were consequences to this particular business model and consequences to burning fossil fuels. Now, the fossil fuel industry has an opportunity to be an energy industry where we can still power society, but do it in a clean and sustainable way that doesn't have the consequences of climate change. The, the tech platforms that we're operating with right now, they found this resource of human attention and they found a way to extract human attention for financial profit. And they've built business models around this. Um, and this is what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism, that they are extracting human experience and all the things that we do to build a model to to sell us and to for the prediction and uh, the advertising based model um it doesn't need to be based on this business model it doesn't need to be based on our attention and our data there are other ways that we could fund these types of platforms um people pay for Netflix or Hulu or HBO in exchange for quality content. People pay Sirius XM radio for quality content. Um, there are business models where we could be paying for social connections. And, and I also wanna add like, if social media was designed for us, I think it would look completely different than it looks right now. The whole idea of an infinite feed is in part this mechanism so that we see advertisements in passing over a, a long period of time. The whole idea of, um, ha I mean, the friends you may know, this is a Facebook feature, right? But it's um, the more and more things that the algorithms can recommend that you follow, the more nodal contacts that you're connected to, the more potential engagement, the more potential advertisements that can be seen. Um, Facebook figured out really, really effective ways to grow. I remember in the early days on Facebook, I had like 100, 200 friends on Facebook. And then after being in it for a decade, it keeps recommending more and more people. And now if there's somebody that it's recommending to me and it says we have 150 mutual friends, I probably don't actually know like a hundred of those people in the mutual friends category. Um, these platforms aren't designed around improving our friendships. They're not designed around improving our connection. Um, there's another thing that we didn't really go into the film around uh, things like the Dunbar number. So there's this research that says we can only have like 150 meaningful close relationships in our lives. Um, that's like tribes get to about that size and you can maintain social connection at that 150 number. But when you go beyond that, it really becomes difficult to maintain strong relationships. So imagine if social media had a place for you and your closest 10 friends that was really designed around 
hey, you know what? This is what I'm struggling with in life right now. And our whole friend circle can come together and help me through a difficult period in my life. Or these are the things that this friend group is really interested in wanting to learn and wanting to learn together. Um, but it's designed around small groups and communities, not this notion of like a million followers that um, you're not going to have a real relationship with. So uh, one of the things that I really like, I don't know what your interests are, Nina, but like go into computer programming and invent the next social media platform that people are going to want to pay you for because you're providing so much value to their lives that you make me feel better after using it. Like just imagine that, right? Imagine Snapchat or Instagram that made you feel better after you, you used it, that made you feel closer with your close friends and family. All of that is, is possible. All of that is possible. We just need people to build that. And I love your question though, yeah. Excellent question. Yes, we need the right incentive structure. Let me bring in Jeff Knudsen for a moment. Um, Jeff, I mean, I think that you know, all of us feel overwhelmed by the scope of the problem. Uh, and like many other problems or challenges that we're dealing with from climate change to so many others, that feeling of being overwhelmed can also make us feel hopeless. But you work specifically with the education team at, at Common Sense Media, and I want to hear from you about how you suggest that we, what actions we take, what type of individual responsibility and practices we institute in order to address some of these issues. Yeah, you know, in the education space, this issue has uh, become a really important one. A lot of people are talking about it. And I think one of the things that the, the film really highlights so well is that the same things that make social media platforms feel addictive to us are also the, the same mechanisms that make it a bad place to get news and information about the world. Um, if you think about social media as a learning space, um, people are learning a lot of things there, but we have to ask, like, what are they learning? Um, and so we have to remember the goal of the platform is to get us to share as much information about ourselves so the platforms can monetize that. Um, it's not, the business model is not built around helping us become informed about the world. Um, and so, you know, in the education space, in the media literacy space, for the past four years, there's been this big focus on fact checking. Like we have to teach kids how to fact check everything they see, you know, because if they fact check stuff first, then they won't share fake news. And like, I, I want to say that I, I think fact checking is a valuable thing, but um, I don't think that teaching kids to fact check everything is going to fix this problem. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, you know, I don't care who you are, you can't fact check everything you see on your social media feed. There's just too much there. Um, so, you know, even a fraction of it, it's just not possible. And number two, even if we could fact check it all, I think what we've learned from this film is that it, it might not matter because we're missing this point, which is that people don't share news, like an actual news story, to inform their friends about the news. People share a news headline to inform their friends about themselves. So anything we're sharing becomes this sort of reflection of us. And that's what the platform is really fine tuned to do is to help us share things about ourselves. And so, um, you know, the big question is like, so what do we do? What do we do about this as educators, as parents? And I think, you know, it's not merely about teaching kids to be fact checkers. Um, you know, you can teach people to go to Snopes or you can teach them even how to do it themselves, like a reverse image search. Um, and that's fine, but what we have to do is we really have to help kids develop a disposition to think critically, but not cynically, about the media that they see. And that's all media, including everything they see on social media. And part of that is learning about fact checking, or part of that is learning about, you know, some of the mechanisms that are, you know, causing us to feel addicted to uh, our phones or our social media networks. Um, but really, it's more than that. It's about helping people develop this critical mindset that they need, that they can carry with them everywhere they go. You know, in education, we're really big on teaching facts or skills, but sometimes we lose sight of the dispositions that people need in order to use those skills or employ them at the right times. Um, and so that's that's a big part of our focus. So that, that's an essential point. Um, and I think that, you know, this is something that I grapple with in the university context of trying to, where we have power consumers of media and power producers as students and trying to get them to become critical consumers and intentional producers. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's a struggle and it's also a moving target. Jeff, 
not that we all, Jeff Orlowski, not that we have to come to you for all the answers and that you're going to give us that nice checklist that we can fill out uh, and, and and make this all go away. However, are there some facts that, yeah. that, that you have uh, or that you would also like to disseminate here beyond the sort of phone swapping, you know, newsfeed swapping? Um, and maybe just even talk a little bit more about your own journey in that. Yeah. Um, I I think part of it is that there are lots of different problems that we're reflecting on right now, right? There's not a singular problem. I, I would say the the biggest core one that if I could wave a magic wand and have a change would be um, to to kind of disband or, or, or change this business model that drives social media and search um, and flip this business model into something that's actually designed for the public good. Um, and then in a rebirth of how the technology is designed and built, um, have diverse people in the room that are thinking critically who understand how human sociology works and how our psychology works and how our communication works to invent technology that really serves the needs of the public. So that's like the big solve that we, we need to be striving for. But in the interim, I feel like there are things that people can do to sort of protect themselves and defend themselves. You know, for me, one of the things as I was weaning myself off of social media, off of Facebook, um, I was also learning about the resurrection algorithms and what they do if you use the platform less and less. And I was starting to get notifications in my inbox and then ultimately via text messages. And the word resurrection is actually what they use internally at many of the companies. I know they do it, use it internally at Facebook where you are like literally dead to them and they need to resurrect you back to the platform. And that is the goal. And they will just throw a whole bunch of stuff out and they're basically going fishing to see what you might engage with. Um, and it was, uh, you know, for me, I was getting emails and then to text messages and the text messages were like, here are people in your professional work circle that are posting about different things and here are family and friends and look at what they're seeing and all thousands, these number of thousands of people did whatever this week. And then there was one that was like, here's a photo of a girl that you had a crush on in high school and seeing this person's name pop up. And I was like, okay, that's, that's like a low blow and really feeling how manipulative um, these platforms were trying to get me to come back. Now, as a reminder, there was no engineer sitting there trying to get me to actively come back. This was just an automated system that was just trying a whole bunch of stuff to see what would work. It was that realization and really sensing and seeing how the incentives and, and their motivations were not aligned for me. Like this isn't for my well-being. It was just to get me to come back to the platform. It was that perspective that I think really helped me wean myself off and stop using these social platforms. So understanding what the motivations are and how they actually operate and what they're designed for can, can be just like a first step in people understanding uh, what's going on. But the other, the other thing I would say, and, and Nina, uh, great that you're back on. I'm curious about this for you and for your friends. Like one of the things that I found most valuable is if uh, a teenager watches a film or if their family watches a film is to see them together uh, for, for the family or a COVID pod to watch the movie together. And then also to share it with your other friends and your other family, their families, so that your whole friend circle can now have a shared conversation around social media. And I'm, I'm curious, Nina, for you, like, is this something like, did you watch it with your family? What are, what are the people around you talking about? Yeah, I, I saw it with my family and immediately recommended that my friends watch it too. And um, our, our text group has been sort of uh, scattered freaking out is what I would call it, um, got it. since each person has watched it. And I think they've all had really interesting discussions with their families about, you know, what's really happening. But because we're, we can't really meet up in person, we haven't been able to have, um, I think, what would be a really healthy conversation between um, our friend group about what's right. going on and right. Yeah. Awesome. But at least they're all watching it. Right. Which is, yeah. which is great. And, and you're referencing a text group and that's, uh, I, I, I want to point out text messaging. I think text messaging is a great communication platform. FaceTime. I've been using FaceTime all during COVID. I've been closer with my close friends and family all the more because I'm seeing them and engaging with them. Zoom, Streamer, these are, these are communication platforms that as a reminder, like we pay for them, like you paid for FaceTime, you pay for text messaging. These are services that are really designed around us. Um, and as opposed to an Instagram or a Snapchat that has other incentives, 
that have other motivations that have, you know, there are metrics that are going on on Instagram or Snapchat that that don't really align for one's mental health. Um, if you're comparing yourself to other images, if you're seeing things that you're really in like desirous of, um, it, it can really warp your understanding of the world and your perspective on the world. I'm curious if, if Jeff, you've got more on that, that uh, or, or Gabe or anybody. Um, and uh, this also applies to TikTok as well, right? So TikTok, Snapchat, these have become, I can't, I'm, I think one of my favorite things in this whole process has been, seeing TikTok users posting TikTok videos about the social dilemma. And like in the same sentence, they're like, please follow me and share and blah, blah, blah. And it's it's like I- Or sort of like, like an AA meeting in a bar. Yes, exactly. Pretty funny, an AA meeting in a bar, yeah. Um, so Jeff Knudsen made a point earlier about what news media means to us when we're consuming it on our phone in the context of other posts from friends and reactions and and the way that now news is put out there for you to react to it and for someone else to essentially make it part of their personal billboard, right? Nina, I'm just curious, for you, when you consume news, you're consuming it, you, you're, you don't remember the day of newspapers when that was our only option and things like that. News is a social experience for you. And I'm curious as to if do you feel a very, emotionally emotional connection to the news that is that it moves you emotionally and how much uh how that impacts the way that you interact with it i definitely have a very uh emotional reaction to the news and i i really want to know what's going on which is why i actually don't um get my news from instagram or snapchat or even tiktok i have to say i i really get my news from twitter which I get my news from there because I like to know what's happening as it's happening. And I like to see the, um, I don't know, I like to see the story develop before it gets put in the papers. And then later I'll, I'll read the articles about whatever event has taken place. But um, I found it really interesting when I followed like the Washington Post and New York Times on Instagram, because then I get all these suggestions for news, which is more like clickbait for not news and mm. that has been creepy again to me and so that's why i've decided to keep my my pictures of me drinking coffee and my friends at the beach separate from um what's going on in the world okay so what i want to first of all uh, give you kudos for having what i would call an intentional news seeking yes. experience rather than a passive one um, where we're sort of just moved by the waters of the news feed um, in one emotional direction or another. Um, and it's difficult not to be, partly. And, and it also, as a journalist, I just want to say that it also impacts the way in which news is produced. That is, news producers, even the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, are trying to produce headlines that perform well on these platforms, which means they have an emotional component right. rather than an information component. So that's just one way in which this business model kind of affects everyone. Yeah. I want to go back to this business model for a moment, and I want to first ask Jeff Orlowski and then Jeff Knudsen about this. When we talk about how this is, in a way, the, the end result that you get from a business model paired with massive data collection and computer engineering and social psychology, right? There, I, I take from that a sort of hopeful point that is, because I think that we, we react to this in two ways. One is we have to change our own practices, like, you know, just the way for climate change, we have to stop eating meat or, or, or so forth. Yet at the same time, there are massive corporations whose incentive structure needs to be changed in order for us to address climate change. Same thing with social media. There's this uh, double component of what is our personal responsibility and then what is our societal responsibility for regulation and other things like that. Do you, Jeff Orlowski, see if we could kind of create a regulatory structure in which these companies are not so handsomely rewarded for pulling this off every second of the day that we could have a, we could return to possibly a common set of facts or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Great question. And I, there's so much I want to talk through with this. Um, I, I love the comparison to climate change as well. And, and I've spent with my past films a lot of time thinking about and working on climate change. And I think one of the failures here is like it, I don't believe it should be the burden of the public to solve climate change. Just even in your referencing of, of eating less meat, 
these are individual actions that we can do and are sort of now forced to do. The companies want the burden to fall on the public. Where in my mind, I think this is the role of government and the responsibility of government to help protect the public from harms they might not even know about. And that the burden in many ways should be on the offenders and the corporations that are that are causing this. So along that same parallel, I think there are countless individual actions that we can do for protecting our own minds and our families and our, our sense making of the world individually in relation to these platforms. But really the burden needs to come from the, the, the responsibility should be on the companies themselves that are profiting enormously on the ripping apart of the fabric of society. And keep in mind, like we don't pay anything for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, yet they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars. They have become the richest industry in the history of money through an extractive model that isn't aligned with our best interests. So I, I absolutely do believe that there needs to be some sort of regulatory introduction, some regulatory frameworks and guardrails around what is going to um, provide for a healthy information ecosystem. That's really what we're talking about, right? The fossil fuel industry and, and um, industrial capitalism have destroyed our natural ecosystem and our social media and search engine companies are destroying our information ecosystem, the way we get our news and information. And just one last thing to tack on there, Nina, uh, uh, as Gabe was saying, huge kudos on your intentional use of these platforms um, and the way that you're seeking out information. But I do wanna remind you that Twitter is also giving you your own customized self-reflective view of the world, right? As opposed to going to the sources themselves. So if you went to your chosen news sites and a variety of them with different perspectives as well, then you're getting a different level of news and information than what Twitter might be feeding you an algorithm of. And just with one, one slight, I know I'm going off on a rant, but um, one other example here, um, I, I don't bring this up from any political perspective, but just from a very objective, uh, let's look at how the system operates. We, we know that the president um, uses Twitter on a regular basis. He's, he's a very avid user of Twitter. Nobody has any insight into what the president sees on Twitter, right? The, we can all check Fox News. We can all check a billboard in DC. We can all see a shared conversation of what's happening, but nobody on the planet, um, except for maybe some engineers at Twitter who could look and see what President Trump is seeing, we don't know what information feed is being fed to the president of the United States. Um, and even if somebody were to go and build a replica of his account and who he follows, it would not look the same as the president actually receives when engaging with it because the algorithms are optimizing particular content in particular ways based on usage pattern for each individual person. So I, I bring this up just because um, even Twitter as a news source, um, this is where a lot of journalism has moved towards, yet there's a fundamental flaw in my mind around how Twitter's algorithms are operating in terms of the propagation of news in certain filter bubbles. Um, and there's, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. I was gonna go into like news voids and a whole bunch of other stuff, but the, the exciting conversation. <laughs> um, what was that, Gabe? I said, you're speaking my language here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Je Jeff Knudsen, we've got this issue again of uh, that uh, Jeff Rolowski, referred to of, you know, what is our individual responsibility as actors? And then what, and then really, however, in terms of solving this problem, that is a societal challenge. Um, one that has to happen through the wheels of government and regulation and other things as well. Um, you working at Common Sense are part of a group that seeks to, on, on a bigger scale, inform and, and create a set of guidelines. Is there um, for both educators and for families and, and kids as well. Um, but is there a kind of, do you have a quick kind of to-do list, checklist, um, or advocacy list that you believe that people should follow? Yeah, well, I think, you know, number one, the film I think is a great educational resource. I think the, the fact that this film is bringing these, conversations up and that people are having these conversations now is is a huge step forward in the right direction. Um, you know, I think part of that is helping people uncover the mechanics of the platforms that, that we all use and that we're all a part of. So like, yes, on the one hand, I absolutely agree that regulation is 
where we need to go with this, that it shouldn't be on the backs of, of users or so-called users of social media platforms to, to change. That said, we do have a responsibility as educators, as parents to help, uh, help young people understand what they're a part of and what they're participating in. Um, you know, I like to say that digital citizenship is not a set of do's and don'ts, that when it comes to media literacy, there, there really are no rights and wrongs. But what we have to do is kind of help people develop that critical mindset that they need to interact in these platforms and to understand and be conscious and aware of what they're doing, how their actions impact others and how the actions or, you know, the algorithms are impacting them. Um, and so thankfully, our you know, we have our digital citizenship curriculum, which is built around this type of a, a pedagogical model. Uh, it's not a set of do's and don'ts. It's not a set of rights and wrongs. It's more a set of dilemmas. And we try to bring in these sort of real world issues and problems and have students think critically about them, discuss, and sort of almost practice going through the thought process that you go through when you're experiencing you know, something being fed to you on your social media feed that you think you're going to have an emotional reaction to well let's let's like sort of pause and think as we say in that moment how are you going to react to that will your reaction be emotional and, and it may be but then what action are you taking on the platform or maybe off the platform well i, I want to highlight that for a moment jeff um, because you brought up the term digital citizenship which i think is important to help us kind of frame this um, a lot of media literacy work i think of as really being about citizenship in the 21st century, right? Uh, it's a 21st century civics, civics class. Understanding how to navigate that terrain is just as important as how a bill becomes a law and all those other things, right? And we need that collective understanding. The other thing is that just as with certain causes around climate change, et cetera, we, there is also a public mobilization for this. Digital citizenship, media literacy, can help spark that public mobilization for change, for regulation, for accountability that pretty much has been absent so far. Um, and this is a little bit, again, uh, to go with the, the addiction metaphor, um, it is difficult for the addicts themselves to sort of really advocate for this change, yet I think that is kind of partly what's, what's happening. Um, Jeff Rolowski, I've got a couple questions for you as we begin to wrap this up. Um, but do you see a next step here after this film? What is the kind of conversation um, you would like to the public to be having and where should it go next? Yeah, um, great question. Um, uh, I think in many ways, the hope is to have a societal conversation around um, how is this technology affecting our lives and our society? And I think we've always heard the really, really positive opportunities, and we need to be aware of the negative, the negative consequences as well. Um, my hope is that this can be a, a wake-up call, a reckoning for society, um, a shared truth about our breakdown of a shared truth. Um, it can help people. I, I've had so many people come up and say, I understand now why I feel the way that I feel. And that for me has been one of the most um, impactful and like success stories of the film that it's giving the public, um, whether at the individual level or at the societal level, an understanding of what's going on and what's puppeteering us as a society. Um, we use this analogy in the film around technology. There's a Steve Jobs analogy. He always wanted the computer to be a bicycle for the mind. And a bicycle is a tool that's sitting there. And when you use a bicycle, you can move faster and farther. And now electric bikes, you can go even farther and even faster. Um, but it's a tool that really helps humans be more human. I think that was always the idea and the insight um, to, uh, to Steve Jobs and many of the early tech designers. We, we're now in an era of technology that is not designed to empower us. It's, it's figured out ways to extract from us and to exploit us. And I hope that this is a phase like this, this uh, we'll look back at this decade of dopamine and recognize, wow, we messed that decade up, but uh, we're going to improve things in the future. And I, I really do hope that we can build new technologies and change the existing technologies so that they are tools for society. Um, and and that, that's really my hope. And this is going to require 
people at all different levels. It's going to require the public demanding change. It's going to require the public changing their individual interactions with it. It's going to require putting pressure on the tech engineers to change the stuff from the inside. And if that doesn't work, it's going to require politicians um, enforcing legislation and, and, and regulation that that forces the companies to change to be aligned with human needs. Um, this is a this is as complex as climate change. Um, you know, there's no silver bullet. There's no really, really easy solution. But I think this is something that we all have to get involved with, and we all have to do our part to put pressure to make these changes happen. Uh, otherwise, the status quo doesn't doesn't look very good. Um, well put. I've got one last question for Nina before we go back to you, Jeff, for a final wrap up here, as, as I think our time is winding down. Um, Nina, I've got a daughter your same age. Um, she is feeling the weight of the world right now, as I imagine you are too. And I also feel that she's looking around and just saying, what the hell are the adults doing? And I don't know if you feel that way as well, um, but just sort of understanding issues around climate change, issues around polarization and things like that. And I think she's curious as to why uh, people my age aren't screaming at the top of their lungs all the time. And I, do you have any sort of questions for adults? Is there, are you curious about the way that we're sort of going about our business as if nothing was wrong? Well, I think, I don't know how useful screaming is. And so even though I, I think it really gets out your anger and your frustration, I don't think it, it necessarily causes change. And so I can understand why um, not, not that many adults are, are sort of screaming at the top of their lungs and sort of feeling feeling what um, I feel and what your daughter feels. But I am just curious, like, how did we get here? What were the small steps that happened and what were the small events that happened that caused us to get to the place where we are today in, I mean, with the, with the climate, with social media, with, um, I mean, with every issue we're seeing today, what, why, why are we, why are we feeling this, this just world craziness now and what caused what caused that? I know, I know that's a really big question, but that's well, what well, thank you for that. I mean, I think one thing we need to do is is listen to the voices that we're hearing from people your age, uh, because sometimes they're coming through, you know, very loud and clear, and we need to pay more attention. Um, Jeff Wolowski, as we begin to sort of wrap this up, um, you've dealt with some pretty dark so topics in your career. Uh, ahead of this was, uh, or before this was, chasing coral and chasing ice. And now, uh, which is again, as you alluded to, about our physical world, and here we have one about our social world. I'm kind of curious as to how you maintain uh, a calm, collected uh, psyche as you pursue these topics, which yeah. can feel overwhelming. And if you have any that, advice, that, that, that we think that's about. an assumption that I'm maintaining a calm, cool, collected approach. Um, no, sometimes I joke that our team were just masochists looking. Uh, we hang out with existential scientists and now existential technologists who are all concerned about the the challenges of the world. And and Nina, to your question, there the consistent thing that we've seen with both of these big crises. Um, with climate and with tech is the consequences of just completely unregulated corporate capitalism that has a financial incentive that isn't aligned with humanity's interests. And, um, you know, it, I'm just struggling with how do we make these big societal changes and, and the ways we need to. Um, to your question, Gabe, I, I do genuinely feel like I am an optimist. There's a, uh, there's a, quote that we have like a, a part of at the end of the film from Jaron Lanier because people would ask Jaron, he's the uh, the guy with the dreads and the hair, just a brilliant, brilliant mind. Um, uh, there's a quote that he had around people asking him, why are you so pessimistic? Why are you pessimistic about the technology? And his response was, no, I'm not pessimistic. I'm actually optimistic. I believe that things can be better. It's the complacent people. It's the those who are happy with the status quo. They are the true pessimists. And that, when I, when I heard him say that, I it, it clicked for me. I think why I care about these issues and why I've been trying to work on on these issues because I do believe we can do better. I believe we can. We have the facts and the science and the information to inform us on what are causing problems in our society and how we can use the, those facts and that information to 
craft and build a better society for the future. And we need to do that with our climate. Otherwise, humanity's screwed. Uh, we need to do that with our tech as well. What does regenerative, what does a regenerative um, ecosystem look like? That's the, the word that's being used a lot in the climate conversation around regenerative technology, regenerative agriculture, regenerating uh, our, our planet. And that same thing, I think, needs to apply to the fabric of our society and the technology that drives it. Um, how do we create regenerative technology that adds to the human experience? Um, I, that is what has me very hopeful and optimistic in that we can build that type of technology. We can restructure these relationships. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, I, I am still very hopeful. And it's the generation that we're talking to right now. It's the kids in high school today. It is, um, it's you, Nina, like, what are you gonna do? Um, we need your help. <laughs> um, and so that that is what has me very, very optimistic. I think um, there's just a growing, the need for change is so obvious and it will continue to become more and more and more obvious. And uh, I am optimistic about, about people taking action. Okay, Jeff, I wanna, I wanna wrap it up here. I wanna thank all of our panelists, but I think that that point that you're making of collective action and individual action together uh, is very powerful. Uh, Nina, thank you so much. Jeff Knudsen, really yes. appreciated uh, your, your, your thoughts on this and, and prescriptions for us. I would like to give it back to Sarah Bowman to to wrap up here. But um, again, this has been a wonderful conversation. And I'm glad that we were able to end on a note of, of optimism. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. You're muted. Thank you so much for all that intelligence and uh, very inspiring words from each of you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe, for your excellent moderation. Uh, and thanks to the audience who came to spend time with us this afternoon. Um, as, as Jeff said, this is your wake up call. We are all in this together. It's really time to build a movement to change this. And I think the, the best way to do it is to continue to have these conversations within your home looking further into these topics, talking about it again and again. It keeps changing. The news is breaking. This all helps kids build their worldview uh, through yours. And uh, that's that's parenting. I hope you've enjoyed this program. We have over 41,000 ratings and reviews on the site. We look at video games, books, movies, TV, helping you decide what's appropriate. After every uh, review, we have something called Families to Talk About, just offering you prompts if you, we're not always gonna have a movie club, but uh, offering you prompts, prompts of things you could talk about after the film, just to get yourself going. Um, we recently did our uh, research on mental health and your kids, uh, which uh, our panelists were referring to, the mental health of this generation, which we know is strained. Um, and we have a new voter's guide to social media, which looks at each platform and how they're informing or not informing kids truthfully about the news. So those are all just a sampling of the kind of resources on our site. We have just rich, rich materials. And as I said, tons of people back here uh, trying to get them all up online for you there. So please consider giving to a common sense to help us keep these ratings and reviews free to all of you. We can't do it without your help. So we hope you enjoyed this program and we'll see you soon. Thanks again to all our panelists.